Well, I'd like to begin by saying that it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here at the Chinese University of Hong Kong as Mocking Yu visiting professor. I'd like to thank, obviously, the Mocking Yu Foundation, equally obviously, Professor Chong Wai Lin, uh, the whole of the Department of Music for making me so welcome, and I'd like to thank everybody else who was involved in making it possible for me to be here. Thank you very much. Since the millennium, there has been a total change in thinking about creativity in, in music. It's not long since the term musical creativity summoned up images of composers in garrets. That's supposed to be Beethoven. Creating music meant writing things down, and it happened alone. Now it's just the other way around. A recent edited book on the subject begins from the premise that musical creativity is performative and collaborative. It contains, the book contains, just a small cluster of chapters on neuropsychological processes based on the traditional assumption that creativity happens within the individual creator's head. But otherwise, the book is all about creativity as something that arises in real-time interactions between different people. This reaction against the artist in a garret model of creativity and the fetishization of genius that went along with it was certainly overdue. And of all the arts, music is perhaps the one that most clearly exemplifies the social dimensions of creativity. In this lecture, then, I want to set out a social or relational model of creativity built around the idea of making music together. But, of course, collaborative performance is by no means the only sort of creative practice in music, so I want to go further and persuade you that ostensibly non-social forms of creative practice, solo performance, lone composition, I want to persuade you that these can also be understood within the same relational model of creativity. Now, according to the creativity theorist and jazz pianist Keith Sawyer, the engine that drives collaboration is conversation. This is an idea with deep roots in the cultures of both jazz and string quartets. In 1829, Goethe described the string quartet as the most comprehensible type of instrumental music. One hears four reasonable people engaged in conversation with one another. But there are many other examples of this comparison going back, at least as far as the composer and critic Johannes Reichardt in 1777, and extending at least as far forward as Brian Fernihoe in 2011. The key idea is that quartet textures with their kaleidoscopic interplay of statement, interjection, deferral, and silence, that Quartet textures embody the qualities of cultivated conversation, reasoned debate, spontaneity, conviviality, and openness to the other. As in good discussion, writes Richard Sennett, richness is textured as disagreements that do not, however, keep people from continuing to talk. As a cellist as well as a sociologist, Sennett is speaking of a rehearsal of Schubert's Octet for Wind Instruments and Strings, in which the clarinetist complained that one of his top notes was too harsh, and this note of disagreement is one I'll come back to. Bad listeners, Sennett continues, bounce back in generalities when they respond. They're not attending to those small phrases, facial gestures, or silences which open up a discussion. This time, he's talking about conversation, but his sentiment is one with which any jazz musician would concur. As is overwhelmingly demonstrated in Paul Berliner's monumental ethnographic study of jazz, the idea of conversation is deeply embedded in jazz discourses, and it's formed the basis of much theor theoretical writing about the interactions between improvising musicians. Maya Gratier, for example, focuses on the idea of conversational grounding, by which she means the small rituals of interaction by which people in discussion acknowledge one another's presence, dovetail their speech with their interlocutors, repeat what the other says, 
complete their sentences, or signal that they're still listening. All these things, Gratier argues, have their equivalence in the mutual interactions of jazz musicians, conveyed through sound, but equally through body motion, sight, or any other available sensory modality. Frederick Seddon talks about the verbal interactions through which the other is recognized and validated, but the self is also validated. For instance, when you echo or elaborate what your interlocutor says. Now, the study in which she says this involves both verbal and musical interactions between performers, and in each case, he characterizes collaboration in the same way. It involves empathetic attunement, multimodal interaction between group members, an atmosphere of risk-taking, and the challenging of one another's creativity. Two things make this work particularly interesting to me. The first is that it covers both jazz and classical music. An initial study of a jazz sextet by Seddon was followed up by a collaborative study of the Paul Klee sing string quartet, uh, and there was what Seddon calls an extraordinary degree of similarity between the findings of the two studies. Seddon and his co-researcher, Michele Basuti, concluded that the processes of creative interaction in jazz and in string quartet performance are just the same. Then the second thing that makes this interesting to me concerns what Seddon and Basuti call spontaneous musical utterances. As Seddon explains, musicians describe how they listen to recordings they've made and hear themselves playing thing, novel phrases or employing novel interpretations of pre-existing phrases in ways that they never previously practiced that have emerged as a result of what the other musicians were playing at the time. When this happens, the clay quartet second violinist commented, the other members understand his intentions, and they follow him because some different things are coming out, and many times are more interesting than what we did during the rehearsal. The cellist added that such episodes are risky, but it is a risk that gives great joy, because in that moment, you're really making music. In short, then, new, unpredicted, and indeed unpredictable things happen in the real time of performance. The Clay Quartet's second violinist spoke of how at such moments the quartet is no longer four individuals, but only a unique energy. And such moments of what Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly calls flow are often associated with the sense that the music is coming not so much from you as through you. The first violinist of the Guarneri Quartet, Arnold Steinhardt, writes that when the quartet are performing, all four of us together enter a zone of magic somewhere between our music stands and become conduit, messenger, and missionary. Carmen Lundy even draws a parallel between singing in a jazz band and in church. Sometimes, she told Paul Berliner, I really feel that I'm just the vehicle, the body, and that something is really singing through me, like I'm not controlling everything that I'm singing. The last time I sang, I thought to myself, gosh, I feel like something is just singing through me. So I want to link these three things, unpredictability, the sense that agency is transferred from individual to group, and the sense that the music is coming from somewhere else, and I want to suggest a way of understanding them that's based on conversation analysis, and specifically on Michael Silverstein's idea of indexical entailment. Okay, now the premise of this is that a great deal of speech makes sense only in the particular context in which it's taking place. Even pronouns such as he and she are meaningful only if you know who they're referring to. So it's not surprising that conversations often develop through speakers reinterpreting what has been said and building on it in a new direction so that, the unexpect so that unexpected creativity emerges from the group. And this is the core of Keith Sawyer's model of what he calls unpredictable emergence, which he outlines in his book, Group Creativity. Now, Sawyer originally worked out this idea in the context of improv theater, in effect a form of stage conversation where, in Sawyer's example, Andy walks onto the stage, he pulls up a chair and sits down, he moves his hands as if holding a steering wheel. Bob, who walks on next, has to work with this. 
he might pull up a chair alongside Andy, so turning himself into a passenger in a car, but instead he fishes in his pocket as if he was feeling for some loose change, and in this way he implies that Andy is driving a bus. And so the act unfolds with each successive action or statement, building on what has already been done or said, but at the same time constraining and so shaping the direction of what will follow, and that's where the idea of entailment comes in. As the situation develops, so entailments can accumulate, and so it calls this constantly evolving pattern of constraints the emergent. In this diagram, he shows the emergent at the top, flowing in time from left to right, and with each performer's intervention, that's P1, P2, and so on, feeding into it. The critical point is that the emergent is created at the level of the group. No one actor can predict how it'll turn out. The same, of course, is true of everyday conversation, of which Sawyer's diagram works equally well as a model. And all of this transfers quite easily to jazz improvisation. <coughs> The entailments now take musical forms, including any relevant generic, stylistic, or other relevant expectations. So it refers to tone or timbre, modal scale permitted, rhythmic patterns, specific motifs, stylistic references, and references to other performances or songs. So that covers the first two issues of uh, the first two features of emergence that I mentioned the way unpredictable things happen in performance, and the sense of creative agency has been transferred from the level of the individual to that of the group. <coughs> <coughs> However, there's a further critical feature of Sawyer's model. This arises out of the multiplicity of choices at any given point, each of which branches out into a further multiplicity of choices, and so on. Sawyer makes a point in terms of theater. Improvisation, I improvisational interaction is highly contingent from moment to moment. A combinatorial explosion quickly results in hundreds of potential performances branching out from each, each actor's utterance, and it's this wide range of possible trajectories that results in unpredictable emergence. Actually, what he says is equally the case of everyday conversation, and the principle of unpredictable, or as I would call it, creative emergence, goes far to explain the apparent inexhaustibility of interpersonal relationships, in other words, relationships that are largely performed through the medium of conversation. And once again, it applies just as much to jazz improvisation. In this way, the same basic principles of chaos theory that are responsible for the unreliability of weather forecasts explains why even the group itself can't predict where and how things are going to go. The course and outcome of creative collaboration lies outside any individual's control, and this in turn helps to explain the third and last feature of emergence, the sense that the music is coming from somewhere else being produced not by you, but rather through you. Now, the only musical context within which Sawyer develops his model is jazz improvisation, but actually the basic model is just as applicable to the performance of notated music. And I can make this point in three different ways. So the first and shortest way is to quote the Guarneri Cortez viola player, Michael Tree, who says, each moment of our playing is conditioned by what has just occurred or by what we think is about to occur. It remains creative because just about anything could happen. The second is theoretical, so it takes a little longer to explain. Musical performance has many elements, writes Dorothea Fabian, and they interact with one another in many ways. We do not just hear pitch, but also its timbre, and therefore the same pitch or note can have a different character and effect. Phrasing and articulation interact with tempo and intensity to create diverse meanings while articulation and tempo impact on the perception of rhythm and pulse, just to name the most obvious interactions, and indeed that list could be extended almost indefinitely, especially if you also include less measurable but highly performable properties that range from tension and release to vitality, tenderness, or the uncanny. All of these represent available performance choices, and as Fabian explains, it's the complexity of interactions between them that results in Sawyer's combinatorial explosion and unpredictable emergence. The difference between jazz improvisation and the 
the, the performance of notated music lies merely in the framework of expectations. They represent different points on a continuum. All we would have to do to extend Sawyer's model to the performance of notated music would be to extend his list of expectations by adding and conformance to notated prescriptions, with the meaning of conformance being entirely dependent on the particular cultural system that's involved. So that was the second way of making the point. And the final way of making the point is simply to juxtapose descriptions of two performances, one a jazz improvisation and the other by a string quartet. So here is the jazz guitarist and philosopher Gary Hagberg talking about Stan Getz and his quartet playing on Green Dolphin Street. And that photo is actually from the very session when they recorded it. So Hagberg says, the sax and piano are hovering in a kind of equipoise. Like two cultured conversationalists, both are, in a sense, holding back. Not because it's not clear how to proceed, but rather precisely because so much is possible. So many avenues are open. And neither wants to be declarative and play preemptively. The joint character of these initial moments doesn't call for that. The bass and drums are part of this. They're there, but they're not digging in. Then we hit the two, five, seven, one major, seven to in the tonic, and a remarkable thing happens. The delicacy wants, the music wants, in one sense, to stay and in another to change. The bass responds to the felt need, and on the downbeat of the two chord, D minus seven, it starts confidently and briskly walking. And it does so knowing it will leave nobody, one, no one behind. It will cause no one any shortness of breath. The second quotation is from Arnold Steinhardt. Uh, whom I mentioned an equally close, but at this, but this time, autoethnographic account of the Guarneri Quartet playing Schubert's Death and the Maiden. And he says, we take courage in the variation second half, roaring to a forte and then subsiding, but my last notes are too free. John has to stand on his head to follow me. Sorry, John. Thanks, John. The cello variation is soon on us. Don't follow David's lead. Instead, watch his third finger, which lifts up for an instant before he puts it down to play. Imagine that. We're with him. No time for self-congratulations. David is now the rhapsodist soloist. We the little wheels and springs of a fine watch. It must be perfectly timed to him. Tonight, David ignores our plight and goes on a flight of fancy. How are we supposed to follow him, follow him and play together at the same time? David's free flight is impressive, and we somehow manage to hang on, but it scares me every time. So subtract the difference in style and in subject position, and we're left with the same values of interaction, mutual listening, balancing of individual co and collective, and care for the other. Values of equal significance in both the social and the musical domains. Now, I regard Sawyer's unpredictable emergence, the way in which collaboration can lead to outcomes that weren't envisaged either individually or collectively, I regard that as a fundamental dimension of musical creativity. At the same time, in the form that he sets it out, Sawyer's model is much too limited to be seen as a general model of creative practice in music. So I want to retain his idea of performance as a network of real-time interactive relationships between human, between human agents, but I want to extend it in a number of ways, including the incorporation within the network of what I'll call such non-human agents as scores and instruments. And I'll explain this in the context of a series of recent articles by Eric Clark, Mark Doffman, and other collaborators, each of which traces ways in which creativity is distributed among different people involved in the creation of contemporary concert music. One issue that emerges is the importance of the relational dimension of collaboration and the work that has to be done in order to develop and to maintain it. Clark and his co-workers say that participants are involved in a social process that extends considerably beyond what's narrowly required to achieve the musical goal. And they borrow Irving Goffman's idea of face work to refer to the ways in which collaborators create conditions of mutual esteem, manage impressions of self to others, and preserve interactional cohesion. Indeed, they see this as in itself a facet of creative practice. There's a degree of creativity involved in the construction and maintenance of the collaboration itself over and above its products. <laughs> 
Another such issue involves assumptions regarding musicians' roles and the tacit rules that surround them. The fifth movement of, Lim's tongue, of uh, Lisa Lim's Tongue of the Invisible is composed around an oboe solo played by Peter Veal, accompanied by other players who improvise on the basis of pitch cells and verbal instructions. I'll play the opening. And I want you to keep your eye on uh, the viola player, Alex Sporeth. OK, so Porath is here. Well, if you watched Alex Sporeth here, well, actually nothing very much happened because he was playing a sort of counterpoint to Veal solo, the oboe solo, and he was staying fairly well in the background. However, in the second rehearsal of this piece, Sporeth unexpectedly took the lead with a prominent and dominating solo at some point submerging the oboe. The rehearsal fell apart at that point, because the other musicians felt that Poor Earth had infringed tacit rules about how you behave when you're accompanying somebody else's solo. And this incident shows how real-time face-to-face interactions are conditioned by the, be the beliefs that collaborators bring with them. In this case, beliefs that have developed over a long period of time and are deeply embedded in conservatory training and professional practice. As the researchers say, history matters. And they see this as the first crucial dimension of creative collaboration uh, that's absent from Sawyer's model, based as it is on the purely synchronous practices of improv theater and jazz improvisation. OK, with the second dimension that we don't have in Sawyer's model, we come to non-human agents such as scores and instruments. And I'll discuss these in sequence. So scores. Scores are written by people, but they also influence people's actions, as any ensemble rehearsal will demonstrate. They act as sites where different views are negotiated. I like to refer to scores as scripting social interactions, and Lisa Lim's Tongue of the Invisible provides excellent examples of this. Um, there's no reason to believe that Lim scripted the confusion that arose in the fifth movement. Uh, with uh, Alex Porath's solo, but uh, her score is. Uh, it, it, but there are a number of points where her notations uh, prompted precisely such effects of bewilderment between the performers. As Clark and his co researchers explain, scores expose boundaries. So let's scores expose boundaries of various kinds musical and socio-political. Rather than converging towards predetermined musical goals, the divergent and initially unstable qualities of the ensemble interactions constitute a set of creative conditions. As for instruments, a particularly clear example emerged from the collaboration between Gorton and Ostasio that gave rise, right to, uh, that gave rise to the composition Forlorn Hope. This began with a two-day workshop at which composer and performer experimented with a number of tuning systems that Gordon had devised. Gordon sat next to a piano, but faced sideways to interact with Ostasio, who sat next to him, guitar in hand. The basic pattern was that Gordon played, trying out the sound of different tunings and improvising short passages based on them, while Gordon listened and evaluated. <laughs> 
There was a six-minute episode during which Hostesio tried out some standard chordal patterns with a new tuning system, hitting on one that created unexpectedly interesting patterns of pitch interference. At this point, Ostasio improvised uninterruptedly for three minutes with Gorton looking on, and I'll play you what happened next. Whoops, wrong one. So you saw how Gorton suddenly sat up when Ostasio played that harmonic and said, what, what did you do there when you played that harmonic? He hadn't expected that sound. In this way, the social interaction between human agents was augmented by an inanimate agent, the guitar, which spoke back to the musicians just as the musicians, just as musicians speak back to one another when they're rehearsing or playing together. The instrument was making its own contribution to Sawyer's emergent. Add in the score with its own set of sometimes unpredictable entailments, and I hope I'll see what you mean when I spoke of such group creativity as a network of real-time interactive relationships involving both human and non-human agents. Now, Clark and his co-workers say that this kind of collaboration between composer and performer is starting to become a new convention. That's true, not least because in the UK, where all the composers they worked with are based, funding for collaborative research has encouraged developments like this. At the same time, what they're documenting is no different in principle from such familiar examples of composer-performer collaboration such as Igor Stravinsky and Samuel Dushkin, Ben Schoen, Britton and Peter Pierce, or John Cage and David Tudor. And these are only the tip of the iceberg, celebrated example of a ubiquitous phenomenon. Collaboration has always been an integral part of composition, it's just that it's tended to happen behind closed doors. Now, in saying that, I'm beginning to set out an argument that there's a collaborative dimension behind what traditional thinking, whether in music aesthetics or copyright law, normally represents as undivided authorship. When I described ensemble performance or composer-performer collaboration in terms of interactive networks of human and non-human agents, I was saying that musical creativity is distributed across the system. In other words, that, it, in, that it's fundamentally relational. It involves relations between people and things. But if I'm to make good my claim that musical creativity is fundamentally relational, then I've got to somehow persuade you that a social dimension is present even when the performers play alone on stage or composers work alone at their desks. And I'll try and do this by arguing that the social and the relational are deeply embedded in musical imagination of which Aaron Copland wrote that the more I live the life of music, the more I'm convinced that it's the freely imaginative mind that's at the core of all vital music making and music listening. Now, Mark Johnson and Steve Larson say that people have no robust way of conceptualizing musical motion without metaphor, and I generalize that claim. Sound is fluid and evanescent. Sound resists shaping in its own terms, and so we shape it through associating it, through associating what we hear with other sensory modalities or with imaginary sonic objects. 
And this isn't just the case of music. In fact, it helps to make the argument to look at a sphere where there aren't such entrenched ways of thinking about creativity as there are in music. So I'm going to approach the topic via a roundabout route. A recent book by Jean-Claude Elena, who creates perfumes for the Paris fashion house Hermé, is full of parallels between the word, worlds of perfume and of music. In particular, Elena likens the process of creating perfumes to musical composition. He refers to himself as a composer of perfumes. And he speaks of creating olfactory form by seeking a pattern, a melody. But what I'm primarily concerned with is Eleanor's account of the basic vocabulary that underlies the creation of perfumes and the culture of perfumery more generally. To make it easier to memorize and to conceptualize odor as an object, he writes, I use words associated with another sense, in particular, the sense of touch. So I say of an odor that is hard, soft, cold, Hot, velvety, dry, flat, sharp, silky, prickly, gentle, thin, heavy, light, harsh, fragile, oily, greasy, and so forth. And Eleanor goes further than this. What distinguishes the vocabulary of the perfumer from that of lay people, he says, is the choice of a common language based on the training provided at perfumery schools and the discussions between perfumers and experts within the profession. In this way, a socially constructed and institutionally validated discourse has created a consensus around certain perceptual features. For the perfumer, soap, aldehyde, jasmine, nail varnish, rose, leather, wood, bonbon, and so forth, are terms that describe the odor and not the object that produces it. That's to say, when the, uh, that's to say that the words refer not to causes, but rather to effects, not to the source, but to a mental picture of the odor. And in this way, Eleanor concludes, the perfumer invents the object of his science. He invents odor, and that is the source of his creativity. Now, there are striking similarities between this way of thinking and music. Where, however, it's a matter not only of words, but also of the notational images that underpin words. Jean Baumberger has written of the way in which notations in use by a community of professionals tend to gain a privileged status. Dominant notations shape their use as internalized active organizing constraints. Their ways of segmenting a given universe, even in what seems to be immediate apprehension, carving out just what kinds of objects and relations are given legitimacy, even credence. And notation serves this function, whether it's externalized on paper or internalized in musicians' minds. Musicians who've learned to think through the mediation of what Bamberger calls standard music notation have in this way made a tacit ontological commitment. It might be said that like perfumers, they've invented the subject of their science. Now, the gains in internalizing this representational system are obvious. As Bamberger says, once giving names to things, we also gain a certain power, the power to play with the things named, shifting our attention at will among them and combining them in novel ways. Equating sounds with notational objects allows specific manipulations that are afforded by the notation in question. Whereas the neumes of medieval chant represented a unified and meaningful musical gesture as a single entity, Standard notation represents it as an assemblage of discrete and individually meaningless objects, each of which corresponds to a potential decision point. In short, because notes are highly decontextualized, they're also highly configurable. And that, to borrow a phrase from Claude Lévi-Strauss, is what makes them good to think with. And that's not just a matter of thinking of sounds or ideas of sound that already exist. In an interview, Bryn Harrison, a contemporary British composer whose music might be described as Feldman meets Fernyhow, cited a well-known statement by Jasper Johns, a New York-based artist and friend of John Cage's. Sometimes I see it and then paint it. Other times I paint it and then see it. Harrison went on to apply this idea to the complex rhythmic notations that are a hallmark of his music, explaining that I'm writing it to hear it as much as I'm hearing it to write it. Notation becomes a means not simply of representing something heard, 
but of the imaginative opening up and exploration of what there might be to be heard in the first place. A similar argument can be made about musical instruments. Musicians think in terms of instruments and their physical affordances in just the same sense that they think in terms of notes and some instruments are better for thinking with than others. But because the central issue is the same with instruments as it is in notes, I'm going to cut to the chase. Whether we're talking about instruments or notes, sound is being conceived by reference to something external to the sound. In the language of Andy Clark's extended mind thesis, you're thinking with material artifacts, and as such, these artifacts are functioning as an integral part of what Clark calls the extended mind. As he explains, if, as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which, if it were done in the head, we would have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process, then that part of the world is part of the cognitive process. That's obviously the case with physical objects like pianos and oboes. But it's equally the case where the material dimension is less overt, as in the case of notes, which don't have to be written down for you to think with them. And according to Clark, there's no significant difference between these cases. And he makes the point through analogy. Functionally speaking, he says, there's no need to distinguish between Inga, who thinks for a moment and then recalls where the Museum of Modern Art is, and Otto, who has early stage Alzheimer's and therefore has to look it up in his notebook. It's just that in Inga's case, the memory is on board, it's integrated into her body, while in Otto's, it's off board. In the same way, thinking with notes is on board, while thinking with instruments is off board, but there's a continuity of function between the two, as becomes obvious when uh, thinking in notes is downloaded onto paper for ease of memorization or manipulation. The archaeologist Stephen Mithen speaks of the cognitive fluidity that has resulted from the downloading of mental contents to such artifacts as paintings, sculptures, and writings, and he sees this as in turn responsible for a fundamental increase in human imaginative powers. And while Mithen is talking about evolutionary history, the same idea might be applied to individual compositional imagination. Sounds are downloaded to representational formats that enable a range of operations to be carried out on them, and then they're uploaded back into sonic experience. Okay, what I've been talking about, what I like to call sonic ontology, is just one aspect of musical imagination, but it's enough for me to advance my more general argument. And I'll do so through some examples of 20th century composition considered in this light. Okay, now Eleanor makes it clear that the specialist vocabulary he describes is the province of the perfumer and not of lay people. Nobody expects Hermé customers to be familiar with it. The same applies to music because, as Bamberger again writes, we do not listen to notes any more than we listen to letters printed on the page. Those who have internalized standard musical notation are able to resolve mus meaningful musical gestures into individual notes, but this is as much a specialist skill as is the perfumer's resolution of an unknown scent into its component notes. That creates obvious problems in terms of the perceptibility of highly rationalized, note-based compositional approaches, such as Schoenberg's serialism. And critics of serialism, of whom there were many, were not slow to point this out. In his 1955 essay, The Aging of New Music, in effect a manifesto against the post-war avant-garde, Adorno wrote of serialism that the arbitrariness of regulation, the mere appearance of objectivity in a decreed system, is already apparent in the rule's inadequacy for dealing with the structural relationships of the music's course in time. Relationships which they will never be able to wipe off the face of the earth. Roger Scruton expressed it in more measured terms. Serialism should be seen as a kind of elaborate pretense at musical discipline, a congeries of rules, canons, and theories, and a mock exactitude which strives in vain to overcome the listener's sense of the arbitrariness and senselessness of what he hears. Okay, well, implicit in these critical claims 
is the assumption that the purpose of compositional imagination and its various prompts is to provide an accurate model or prediction of the listener's experience in the music, in effect working back from the desired effect to the means by which it might be achieved. Working on the same assumption, music psychologist, te psychologists tested listeners' abilities to perceive serial structures and basically found that they couldn't, at least unless they had a formal training in music. These critics and psychologists were all thinking of serialism as essentially a form of compositional structure, creating a, an implied analogy between music and bridges or the steel frames of office buildings. And they also made the further assumption that the point of compositional structures is that they should be heard as structures. But serialism makes a lot more sense when it's seen not as a form of structure, but rather as a creative practice, and I'll explain what I mean by contrasting two composers of the late Darmstadt and post-Darmstadt periods, Georgi Ligeti and Mauricio Cargo. While their aesthetic positions were very different, both composers employed serial approaches in ways that controvert any simple relationship between compositional model and perceptual experience. Uh, in the way that Adorno, Scruton, and the psychologists were taking it for granted. For Ligeti, composition involved designing highly controlled sonic outcomes. But the flexibility of what he called his working out of the composition was enhanced by his acute understanding of the often indirect methods by which such outcomes might be achieved. An obvious example is his use of micro cannons that can't possibly be heard as cannons, but instead ensure a particular textural quality. What Richard Steinitz calls the huge 48-part cannon in atmosphere, which makes use of strict techniques of retrogression and inversion, incorporates serial techniques as a means of achieving chromatic saturation. Steinitz des describes this as a serial means to a non-serial end. Indeed, Ligeti considered his compositional working method to be, in a very general sense, serial, but at the same time, he rejected basic aspects of serial theory that he thought, saw as perceptually spurious. In particular, the application of the same series to different musical parameters. As he complained, there was no guarantee that a single basic order would produce analogous structures on the various levels of perception and understanding. We might then say that serialism was not a core dimension of Ligeti's compositional imagination, but just part of an eclectic compositional toolkit. That's similar to Bjorn Heile's description of Cargill as a serialist whose work was often not serial. And Heile attributes Cargill's casual practice of inventing series as he goes along more or less, or less at random to a similar skepticism concerning their perceptual significance. But in other ways, Ligeti and Cargill were polar opposites. Whereas for Ligeti, serialism was one of many techniques for achieving highly controlled sonic outcomes, Heile writes that Cargill's techniques and procedures seem designed to produce multiplicity, her heterogeneity, and chaos. And what lies behind this, Heile concludes, is an aesthetic premise as different from Ligeti's as could possibly be. For Cargill, he says, Music never simply equates the acoustic facts. In other words, Kagel is interested in the whole event and what people are doing together as much as in the sounds that result. And the result is that in both these cases, though for different reasons, compositional procedure and perceptual effect stand far apart from one another. You simply can't map one onto the other. The relationship is much less direct. And an even more extreme example is furnished by Roger Reynolds, whose compositional approach revolves around the use of both numerical series and visual images. So I'll talk about the visual images, and one composition will do to make the point. It's Symphony Myths, which dates from 1990. Now, a central image of this, uh, of this piece uh, uh, a central image that underlies this composition is a sacred rock formation off the Japanese island of Honshu called Futamingan Ura. It consists of two rocks, as you can see, joined by rope, which Reynolds had seen through the mist on his first trip to Japan 24 years earlier, and which he says stayed very vividly in his memory. 
Now, Symphony Myths was composed to a commission from Tori Takemitsu, and on the day after its first performance in Tokyo, a public discussion took place between the two composers. Takemitsu specifically questioned Reynolds on the processes by which he had translated the image of the rocks into an oral entity. And in response, Reynolds emphasized some of the kinetic qualities of the rocks that could be translated into musical terms. But he also described a quite different process of translation, explaining that his father had been an architect, and hence, as he put it, it's natural for me to draw schematic representations of what I begin to imagine, but cannot yet clearly see, so that writing the piece becomes the actualization of a rather clumsy initial sketch. Now, although the initial sketch is reproduced in the published version of that discussion, it was only with the publication in 2002 of Reynolds's bu book, Form and Method, that it became clear how literal this process of translation actually was. Reynolds begins his account with the same sketch, the upper part of which corresponds to the first movement of the finished composition and is, as you can see, a rough but easily recognizable drawing of Futami Gaura. As, as Reynolds explains, the two rocks translate into massive beginning and ending sections joined by a lyrical linear span, which was itself marked in imitation of the ornamental ties distributed uh, along the triple strand of rope. In the second sketch of the series, Reynolds refines the image, concentrating on the fit of the duration series with the emerging form. The third sketch presents, in essence, the same information in a tidied up form, and a series of subsequent sketches retain the same overall shape, but zoom in on the details of the movement. First, Reynolds resolves the durations of 13 layer ostinato textures through which he expresses the massiveness of the two rocks. Then he outlines the durational and dynamic content of each cell within the ostinato layers. And in the final sketch of the series, note heads at last appear. Now, these visually based sketches interact with a separate series of score sketches that refine the pitch resources for the composition and further work presumably took place within a conventional score format. Uh, now, before going on to uh, say what I've got to say about this, I'll play you the first minute of the movement, which will give you a sense of how Reynolds expresses the massiveness of the larger rock in sound. I'm not concerned with the details of what Reynolds does, but with the question that it poses. What is the point of this elaborate mapping of visual image to time, texture, and dynamics? And in essence, I'd say it's to present compositional problems in a clear and tangible form, one that effectively prompts solutions. Conflicts arise as Reynolds works out the music, for example, between the plan and the resources for its realization. Reynolds welcomes such conflicts on the grounds that they constitute significant opportunities for invention. Elsewhere, he remarks that the multiple accommodations that are acquired as the process continues result in the freeing of local intention, uh, invention for more intuitional vibrancy. Again, he justifies his approach on the grounds that it ensures a constant interplay between what's rational and intuitive faculties, describing the principal function of the formal plan as coherently guiding the moment-to-moment -moment exercise of intuition. 
But perhaps most telling is Reynolds' statement that it's the quality and the reasonable coherence of the many small decisions and adjustments the composer makes while working on it that lend to the music its ability to engage us dimensionally. In short, the elaborate procedure sets up a highly organized situation within which Reynolds can improvise his composition into existence. And the same applies to, the, to all the puzzlingly elaborate systems and apparently arbitrary rules that composers have invented for themselves throughout the history of Western classical music. But I don't have time to go further into that. Now, talking about music in terms of structures, systems, and rules makes it all sound very abstract, whereas in reality, music is just the opposite. Like perfume, it's an overwhelmingly sensory experience, and more than that, it's a highly embodied experience, one that's next door to dance, and not just for performers, but for listeners too. So, in place of the familiar abstractions, let me offer a very concrete image for how musicians work with sounds. They work with their materials in much the same way that a carver works with dense knotwood that is its own pattern of grain, shaving off small pieces at a time. The pieces have to be small so that the carver can feel and be guided by the grain, and in this way, the wood talks back to the carver. It's the same phrase I applied to Ostasio's guitar, and I'm saying that whether it's an instrument, notes on paper, or something imagined, the materials with which composers work talk back to them, and that's how the composition comes into being. Composers sometimes speak of their emerging compositions as interlocutors. When a piece is enough of its own existence, writes Stephen Stuckey, it begins to talk to you instead of you always having to talk to it. You begin to trust the piece. Fred Lerdahl even transcribes such a conversation. I was composing along, he says, and I wanted to start building the piece, make it louder like any normal composer would do, and every time I tried to get loud, the music told me, no, I don't want to get loud. So eventually Lerdahl told it, OK, you want to be quiet? I'll go for broke. I'll see if I can make you pianissimo from beginning to end. And of course, he did. Now, such accounts of the relationship between author and work are widespread across a range of cre creative practices. For example, in the postscript to Wolf Hall, a fictional history of Thomas Cromwell, Hilary Mantel speaks of the magic moment when you feel your characters are really speaking and you don't have to think about the dialogue anymore. As soon as Cromwell started talking, Mantel says, I felt that my job was to simply take down what he said, like a secretary. This is the equivalent of the performer's sense that the music is coming from somewhere else that I linked to Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow. In fact, understood in this light, ostensibly solo, compositional, uh, uh, ostensibly solo composition possesses all three of the qualities I associated with Sawyer's collaborative model of creative emergence. In addition to the sense that the music is coming from somewhere else, these were the unpredictability of outcomes, and the sense that agency belongs not to the individual, but to the group. And I'll take the last two of these in turn. On the one hand, compositional outcomes emerge, in Reynolds' word, from the many small decisions and adjustments that lie between plan and outcome. And the interaction between them creates a combinatorial explosion and hence unpredictability that lies at the heart of Sawyer's model. The result may on occasion be something quite different from what the composer had in mind originally. On the other hand, the compositional process becomes a kind of collaborative dialogue between composers and materials that talk back, or between composer and composition. Studies of creative collaboration constantly underline the importance of trust, which makes Stuckey's reference to the importance of trusting the piece particularly telling. Just as with ensemble performance and composer-performer coll collaborations, so in composition, overall agency is no longer vested in the individual, but rather in an interactive network of plural agents. It is, in other words, a property of the system. <laughs> 
There is, of course, the obvious difference that in ensemble performance and composer-performer collaborations, multiple human agents are involved, whereas in the case of lone composition, all but one of the agents are non-human. But the pattern of distributed creativity is no different in principle from the face-to-face -face collaborations described by Sawyer or by Clark and his co-workers. The music psychologist John Slobber has an explanation for the sense that the music talks back and so on, takes on a life of its own. The reason that composition can appear to the composer to generate its own momentum or life, almost independently of his will, he writes, is that as the material develops, it may cause the composer to modify his or her original goals. Well, that makes sense as far as it goes, but in approaching creativity as a psychological phenomenon, as something that happens within the individual creator's head, Sloboda doesn't engage with the social dimension that I see as fundamental. Even the composer in a garret is part of a network of social relationships that also involves performers, audiences, critics, impresarios, and instrument makers, and such social and professional relationships in combination with notations, instruments, and other on-board or off-board mediations, such as I've described. All of this creates the rich ecology within which the practice of composition takes place. That's why Keith Sawyer argues that even composition is a lot more social than we realize, while according to Göran Fuchstadt, music making is always a collective activity, regardless of whether it's done individually or in a group. This is what I meant when at the beginning I said that ostensibly non-social forms of creative practice should be understood within a social or relational model of creativity. Rather than group creativity being a multiplication of the creativity of individual agents, lone creation depends on an ecology within which the social processes of creative emergence are replicated within the symbolic domain. In this way, lone creativity is a surrogate form of social creativity. There's also a more subjective level at which composers talk about their compositions as if they were people. This was already happening in the late 16th century when, as a covert way of asserting authorial possession in the days before copyright, composers commonly described their pieces as their children or their offspring. In dedicating his second book of airs, uh, Songs and Airs to Sir Henry Leonard, Robert Jones described them as orphans, committing them to the protection of his patron. And today, Andrew Ford gives a new twist to the same idea. When your music is performed, he says, you feel as though the piece has sort of grown up and there's a life of its own now. It's a bit like parenthood, I suspect. And as both a writer and a parent of grown-up children, I'd say that's spot on. All this is consistent with the way in which people respond to the emotional and emotional meanings of music by relating it to the way that they rela by relating to it in the way that they relate to other people. For example, Animika van den Toll and Jane Edwards quote an informant who told them, "I felt befriended by the music. Music personified is your soulmate, your trusted secret friend who can empathize with you." And it's not just composition. It's also at this subjective level that performance is social even when there's nobody else on the stage. This comes through when the pianist Philip Thomas talks about playing a piece by Bryn Harrison, whom I mentioned earlier. You kind of do it so much, Thomas says, I practiced it, and then you got used to it, and it gets compromised again, so I've got to keep kicking myself in the ass to kind of take it again apart again. I think that's the problem. I've got to keep unraveling it. So he's describing an engagement with a notation that has to be enacted anew each time the music is played. It's a two-way process of interaction through which the score talks back and the performance acquires the quality that Lonnie Hilliard ascribed to jazz improvisation when he spoke of it as really like a guy having a conversation with himself. Sawyer has called the Western classical tradition the one remaining bastion of the solitary lone genius myth. Yet it might be more reasonably thought of as embodying a radically distributed creativity that spans years and even centuries. 
A basic premise of the classical aesthetic is that listeners apprehend the musical work as the work of its composer. It's not just a matter of sounds. The score stands in for the absent composer. Respect for the score connotes respect for the composer with such relational values as care, fidelity, commitment, and sincerity coming into play. Philosopher Robert Martin, who used to play cello with the Sequoia Quartet, imagines a rehearsal of the Allegretto movement from Beethoven's Quartet, Op. 59, number 2, which is usually played much slower than the notated tempo, at which one of the players argues, Beethoven's marking for the slow movement is perfect, section of the quarter, so why should we doubt his marking for the Allegretto? I think we'll get used to it, and anyhow, it's what he wanted. You're not denying that, are you? And just as long-dead composers haunt their music, so there are performers who, recon who, who construct their identity around dead composers with whom they feel a special affinity, such as Pablo Casals and J.S. Bach, or Arthur Rubinstein and Chopin. Here the closest parallel is the creative intimacy between biographers or historical novelists and their subjects, as when, again, Hilary Mantel says, I know what it's like to inhabit Cromwell. The cellist Elizabeth Le Guin uses the same word when she speaks of playing a sonata by Luigi Boccherini, the subject of her doctoral dissertation and first book. She said, I, became, I become aware of a poignance of presence, the unmistakable sensation of someone there, and not only here, but inhabiting my body. And she insists that her relationship with a composer who died in 1805, is not only very tender and searchingly physical, but also somehow reciprocal. Even across the centuries, then, making music and personal relationships are inextricably intertwined. Nothing could more clearly demonstrate how, even when alone with the score or playing from memory, engagement with the other lies at the core of music as creative practice. Far from being the one remaining bastion of the solitary lone genius myth, music is perhaps the best possible evidence that the psychology of creativity is, in fact, the social process of creativity absorbed and internalized by those individuals we call creative.